Hello, everyone. Um, I wanted to um, give you a video um, to help with the last bit um, in section 5.3, which is our general antiderivatives. Um, so today we talked about what an antiderivative is. Um, and I kind of, I, I know it was a mad dash at the end of class and I'm really um, sorry about that. Um, so I just want, kind of wanted to give you a video to give you um, more help with this stuff. Um, so I did pass out um, a handout with some of these integrals to help you start to get your brain working in reverse. Um, so antiderivatives are difficult at first because we've been spending the last several months learning how to go forward. And then all of a sudden we're asking you to start to go backward and apply those things you know, but in reverse. Um, it can be a slow process at first. Um, just keep um, fighting through it, keep chewing on it. Um, but I do want to mention that this function, or not this function, this list um, will not be given to you on the final. So um, you are going to have to practice this enough um, so that these formulas kind of start to stick and you get better at going in reverse. So I would say half to two thirds of the way through section 5.3, um, I want you to kind of try your best to work off of like work not including the table. Like I don't want you to have to look at the table to be able to go backwards, if that makes any sense. Start with this to start your brain going in reverse. But once you can start to drive in reverse, I don't want you to lean on this table too much is what I guess what I'm saying, because you won't have it on test four when you get home from Thanksgiving. So start your brain processing this on your own as much as you can. Okay, um, so I'm also going to make a video for you to go through that in-class worksheet so you have lots of examples um, to help you with that as well. Um, but in this video, I want to um, talk about what an initial value problem is and give you a couple of examples for this. So our initial value problem, I guess any initial value problem, um, it gives us a way to find an exact antiderivative by giving us an extra piece of information that lets us solve for C. So each of our antiderivatives includes this plus C at the end. And the reason for that is because remember, each of these is a family of antiderivatives. They all have the same shape, but they can vary by a constant because the derivative is just going to zero these things out anyway. So there could be any constant there we don't know what, what exactly it is unless we have an initial value problem. An initial value problem is exactly that. It gives us an initial value to use to solve for C. So let's look at an example of this. So I want to find F of T given that F prime of T equals one minus one over t squared. And the extra piece of information that I have is that f of one equals zero. This is our initial value, and that's what makes this an initial value problem. This is the piece that you won't have if you're not in an initial value problem. But we have that piece, so we are in fact in an initial value problem. So in order to start these, we first need to work our way to the antiderivative. The reason we need an antiderivative is because I want f of t, my original, and I'm given f prime of t, which is my derivative. So our original function f of t is going to be the antiderivative of f prime of t. And this is going to have a dt on it because my variable is t. Um, I kind of mentioned a little bit in class, this dt tells you what your variable is. And so that's why it's a dt, because this is f prime of t. So um, in order to find my original, I'm going to take the antiderivative of this thing, which means I'm going to find the integral of 1 minus 1 over t squared. OK, and now you can start looking at your list and try to figure out how to work backwards. Um, because I have 1 over t squared, we're going to want to write that as a power. And it's going to be 1 minus t to the negative 2 dt. 
And so the antiderivative of this, because they're separated by subtraction, I'm going to do the integral of 1, or the antiderivative of 1, minus the antiderivative of t to the negative 2. And when I do that, the antiderivative of 1 is my variable t. And then minus the antiderivative of t to the negative 2. In order to take the antiderivative of a power, what I'm going to do is go backwards from the power rule. So instead of dropping our exponent down and subtracting one, I'm going to do that in reverse. I'm going to add one and then divide by that exponent. So first I'm going to add one. So t to the negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1. And then I'm going to divide by that new power. So I'm going to divide by negative 1 out front. And um, I just took an antiderivative, so I'm going to include my plus C. And so overall, our antiderivative is T minus, actually plus, sorry, the negative and the neg this negative. And this cancel out, so it becomes plus T to the negative 1 plus C. That's my original. And notice I have a plus C. If I wanted to solve for it, I can use this piece of information here. And so the because f of 1 equals 0, that says that y is 0 when t is 1. So I'm going to plug 1 in for each of my t values. And then notice this is an an equation in C that I can solve for. So I'm going to combine like terms here and I get 0 equals 2 plus C and I'm going to subtract 2 from both sides which means that C is negative 2. And so now I can put that together with my original function and this says that my exact f of t is t plus t to the negative 1 minus 2. This is my exact f of t that I can found using my anti or using my initial value problem. Okay, um, and the last thing that I want to mention is we can apply this to motion. So if s of t is my position function, then we know that we can take a derivative to get down to velocity. And we can take the derivative of velocity and get an acceleration function. But this works backwards uh, with our antiderivatives. It's the same thing, just in reverse. If I integrate an acceleration function or take an antiderivative, because that's what integration is, it's taking an antiderivative, then I get a velocity function out. So if I integrate acceleration, I get a velocity. And I can do the same thing if I integrate a velocity function and take the antiderivative of velocity, I get a position function. And so that means if I integrate a velocity, I get a position function. And so we can use this knowledge along with initial value problems. So for instance, I have an example here. Um, neglecting air resistance, the motion of an object falling is determined only by the acceleration due to gravity, which in our uh, example here is we're going to be in the um, English system, so we're going to be in 32 feet per second squared for my acceleration due to gravity, my g constant. And then the stone is thrown upward at time t equals zero with an initial velocity of 30 feet per second from a cliff 100 feet above a lake. Okay, so when time equals zero, we have an initial velocity of 30 feet per second. That means the velocity at time zero is 30, because that's what it's launched upward at. And at time equals zero, 
we threw this from a cliff 100 feet above a lake, which means at time zero, my position, my height, is 100 feet above a lake. And the fact that acceleration due to gravity is the only thing determining our motion, I know that my acceleration at any time t is going to be negative 32. And it's negative because gravity pushes you downward. If you throw something upward, you need to fight gravity to throw it upward. Um, so those need to be opposite signs. So down is usually negative for our purposes. So acceleration is negative 32. I want to find the stone's velocity function. So to get a velocity function, I'm going to integrate acceleration. And my acceleration function is negative 32. So when I take the antiderivative of negative 32, I get negative 32 times my variable, which is t. And this is an a general antiderivative, so don't forget your plus c. And so this is my velocity function. But I have another piece of information here about my velocity. This is a um, initial value that's going to help us solve this. So I know that at v of zero, my or at time zero, my velocity is 30. So I'm going to put 30 in here for my velocity, and I'm going to plug zero in here for t. So I'm going to get negative 32 times zero plus c. And when I solve this for c, this is just zero. It goes away, which means 30 is my c value. And so overall, that means that my velocity function, my specific velocity function for this stone is negative 32t plus 30. That's my velocity function. And then finally, it wants me to find a position function. Well, we just found a velocity function. So to get a position function, our position is an antiderivative of velocity. And I, we just found our velocity function, so I'm going to take the antiderivative of negative 32t plus 30. And I need a dt here for my, end, my other bookend, right? This starts my notation, this ends it. And so it's not an integral without your dx or dt. Um, and so now I'm integrating this. And so the antiderivative of negative 32t is negative 32. It's going to come along for the ride. And then to get my antiderivative, this is t to the first. So I'm going to add 1 to my exponent, which makes it 2, and then divide by your new exponent. So I'm going to divide by 2, which is the same as multiplying by 1 half. Or I guess since there's a 32 out there, I'll just write it as negative 32 over 2. That makes my life a little bit easier. And then I'm going to add to that the antiderivative of plus 30, which is 30t. And this is a general antiderivative, so don't forget your plus c. So this is my general antiderivative, but I have an initial value. I know that my initial position at time equals zero is 100. I can use that to solve for C here. And so if when T equals zero, my position is 100. So I'll put 100 in here. And let's see, negative 32 divided by two is negative 16. I'm plugging 0 in for t, and then I'm going to add 30 times 0, and then plus c. Notice when I multiply by 0, these two both disappear, which means that my value of c here is 100, and my exact position function is negative 16 t squared plus 30t plus my C value of 100. And that is the stone's exact position function. 
All right, I hope that helps with the initial value. Um, I'm going to come back and do another video for you with um, the in-class worksheet, which will give you um, an, ex um, an opportunity to practice these integration rules and to practice some initial value problems. So I will see you next time.